Yeah, a lot of people from Lagos, Lagos, Lagos. Welcome, welcome, the Lagos educators. We are starting right away, and um, I would like you to get ready as we start soon. Yes, ma'am. Yes, my can hear you. before this one because it was so interesting and very but uh, I think uh, I will try to cope with this one too. Thank you very much. Now let me welcome you all to this great conference. I was here last year and last then I was at the conference then it was physical. You see how much things have changed. Now we are all online but thank God we can hear each other and this shows us what the future is going to be like. Now, when Eben gave me that topic, leading to leading, Eben, can I have audience participation? How can I have it? Because I would like to ask them questions and have them reply. Okay. So when I ask my questions, you just, uh, you know how to move fast. So my first question is, what is the meaning? Now when he asked me, I do not sleep for like a day or two. Like, what is the meaning of leading to leading? Leading to leading, what is the meaning? So I want people to tell me what they think the meaning is. So get them to type the meaning. Okay. What of leading to leading? Okay. Uh... We are out there. Can you please uh, just uh, type in what you understand of the meaning leading to leading? Are there, are you, are there, are people typing? Do we have a chat room where people can type? Yes, yes ma'am. We, we have a chat room. If you also have a smartphone there, ma'am. You can actually go on, on YouTube with the link I, I sent to you. Right. We'll be getting all the response immediately. Okay. So, people, explain to me. When, when you explain to me, I will then be able to talk. Because if you don't let me know what you think it is, then maybe I, I, I will say the wrong thing. But what is the meaning of leading to leading? Leading to leading. Okay, somebody said that uh, leading to leading simply means leading yourself in order to be able to lead others. Leading yourself in order to lead others. That's a fantastic yes, response. Thank and, you very much. Another person also said step, step that lead you to lead others. Oh. Lead you, pardon? Step that lead you to lead others. Lead yourself in order to lead others, right? Yes, Fantastic. That's enough. So really, really, learning about leading yourself, isn't it? I'll take one or two more responses. Okay, ma. More. Um, somebody said the act of uh, leading so others can follow your pattern. The act of leading so others can follow your pattern. Yes, Thank you very much. That's another great response. I, I knew I was talking to you. Yes, ma. Go on. Go on. Another, um, Aluko, Aluko said, a practice or step that guide you to lead others. Practice of practice the act, the uh, practice or step that guide you to lead others. The practice or step of guiding you to lead others. So yes. I think what we have accepted is that we are all leaders, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. 
we have all these uh, definitions, we have all accepted that we are all leaders. And if we accept that we are all leaders, then we've also accepted that we can lead others to lead, whether it's our students, whether it's our colleagues, or whoever we come in contact with. So I think I agree with you, and I'll go on to my next slide, where I actually agree with most of what you said, but I will also say that um, I also had one or two things that I said. That for me, it all looks like upwards, upward, up, an upward movement. That is, you are a leader yourself. You can sharpen and hone your skills, but then you also need to learn to go upward. So that because when you go up, I hope you know that you bring others up with you. If you stay stagnant on one point, the people stay stagnant on that point as well. So it's leading to leading, and that means for me, learning from other leaders. That means you all said it, learning from other leaders and also getting better at what uh, you are doing. Sorry, I think my screen went off for a minute. Yes, yes. getting better as a leader. If you plan to, if you know that you want to get better as a leader, that means you've accepted that leadership is a journey. It's not something that ends one day and it's not something that you perfect from day one. You keep growing, you keep getting better. It's an upward journey. And uh, leadership is also a skill. And like all skills, you know, there are many skills that we have. We learn to teach. We learn vocations. You can learn to sew. You can learn to draw. You can learn to paint. You can learn to drive. You can learn to ride a bicycle. These are all skills. And leadership is also a skill. And so like all skills, it can be learned, it can be taught, and it can be mastered. And so today we are going to talk about how you are going to go upwards in your leading uh, journey, so to speak. So let me start. You know we are in difficult times. During this pandemic, there was something that I studied a lot. Who are the leaders that made a difference? Because you could see people who are floundering, people who felt it, their life had come to an end. There were people who, who just couldn't make any sense out of what was happening. But there were people who said, well, this has happened. I'm going to get out of it even better than I came into it. Next slide. So these people, and there are certain characteristics that they had as leaders. First, they were creative thinkers. They have to think differently. You know that when we started online, some people said, it's not possible. Nigerians will not do it. Teachers will not you know. You have to be creative thinkers. You have to understand that and, and being creative means you see what everybody saw, what you did, what nobody thought. So you go ahead, be creative, do things your own way, and you'll be surprised at what will happen. We needed people who think differently, people who look at the same situation and are able to make sense of it and are able to think very differently from everybody around them. You know, someone spoke to me this morning. He said oh, he wants to share some things with me and he wants me to buy buy an app from him. He said, do you know that many people are going to lose their jobs? Teachers, I hope you know. Many teachers are going to lose their jobs. Two leaders are going to lose their jobs. From now, for the next 10 to 15 to 20 years, who knows? And not just because of this pandemic, but because this pandemic showed the weaknesses of the system, the weaknesses in all of us. And so we have to start to think differently about our jobs. People who are proud before to say, you know, no, Facebook, oh, Maybe oh no, this and I don't bragging about their inability to use computer. They are now like dinosaurs, and you know what happened to dinosaurs. People who look for opportunities in every situation, there's a there's a big problem. What happened now was a big problem. I never thought I would face it. When I came in as commissioner for education, I had my plans. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this. Then this thing came. And I just said, Well, I was going to do this. Now I have to do it in a different way. And so we have to start addressing the situation before us, look for the opportunities and start to look for solutions. People who have learned to create scenarios, those are the people who succeeded during this period. People who looked at the situation and said, if I do this, what will happen? If I do this, what will happen? If I do that, what will happen? So you need to start building up your own personal skills of scenario building. Because if you build scenarios, you'll be able to see the best case the worst case, the most likely, and you'll be able to adapt uh, strategies for each one of these scenarios. You know what I'm trying to say in other words is you need to move out of this your comfort zone. All of us need to move out of our comfort zone and start to move out into uncharted waters because the future is uncharted. Nobody could have predicted COVID. Nobody. 
Nobody knew what it was. And it had been here for at least three or four months before the whole world heard about it. People who are willing to diffuse leadership. You see, you cannot, you cannot concentrate leadership on yourself anymore. You have to accept that other people around you are also leaders or potential leaders. And therefore, you have to be willing to share leadership, to diffuse leadership, to let other people grow. Because when leaders grow around you, you grow and you move on. If you stay stagnant, your staff will stay stagnant, your colleagues will stay stagnant, and no upward movement will happen. So I believe as a leader that I have to keep moving. I have to be a rolling target. So they cannot run after me, sure, but I am rolling as well. I'm not staying on one spot. So you are willing to share leadership, to diffuse leadership throughout. Your students must learn to be leaders. They must learn to take responsibility for their own learning. They must learn to take responsibility for their own lives. I remember when I was a principal of a school and a woman came to me, she said her daughter is looking for a job and so on. So I said, tell your daughter to come and see me. I was standing at the window of my office. Do you know that the woman packed, got down and started asking, where is the principal's office? And the daughter sat in the car. So I was watching. Eventually, they told her where my office was. She went back and called the girl. The girl, the locked he got down, you know, followed her inside. When she got into my office, I said, Madam, Madam. In fact, I so spoke to her, then I asked her to please leave my office. This girl is a graduate, she has finished her master's. Leave her alone and let her let her learn. Let her come to me and tell me she needs a job. As it is, she doesn't need a job. She needs mommy, and I'm not her mommy. Mommy by name is not mommy by practice. So you must be willing to diffuse and grow all the leaders in the organization. You must be an empathetic leader. Because people are suffering around you, people are worried, people are sad, you have to support them. You have to empathize. Empathy means I understand where you are coming from. And you do your best to support them. And you must be an intentional leader. Intentionality means that you have a plan. It's not something that happens because you wish it. Something that happens because you plan. So having said this, I'm not going to take you through a video. And I hope you will follow me. I will stop the video periodically and again ask questions. It talks about the different kinds of leaders. And I want you to remember what I just said. I ran you through a whole list of the people who, who, who were successful during this very difficult period. I now want you to look at this video and tell me what you do. And we'll talk through it together. Okay, it's a tech talk, and uh, the man talking is it's a Targum. He's it's a Targum. He is himself a great uh, con um, conductor. So it, it's talking about leadership as a, like conductors. I hope you know the conductors, conductor and orchestra. While the people are playing, he will, you know, raise up here, go down here. He will lead them, direct them in how they should play. But each one of them can play. Each one of them is probably an accomplished musician. But they need a conductor, a leader, to conduct the proceedings, to lead them through it. So, I'm going to play this video. And uh, please just give me a few Yes, I'm going to play this video and uh, pause every few minutes so that you say what the conductor was doing, how he was leading his people, what you think he did well, and what he didn't uh, do well. So please give me a minute while I set it up. Thank you. Wow. Awesome, awesome. And I'm sure that all our participants are blessed with just the full slide. And uh, I go on the I said open space, close space. And and I in fact and I can talk about the And this is fantastic. And it's so amazing that you have a pause, pause, pause. That was just a sound check. Can you hear? Eben, can people hear? Ebenezer, can you hear? Um, if you can send me the link, I can also play that directly to the viewers here. If you can send me the no, link. No, you can't. No, I keep pausing. I keep pausing because I'm not going to play it through. I'm going to pause it six okay. times. Okay. So, I just, and I... 
Okay. Can they hear? Yes, they can hear, ma'am. They can hear. Okay. Okay. Play. So if that was uh, a sort of a success, now who should we thank for the success? I mean, obviously the orchestra musicians playing beautifully, the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra. Um, they don't often even look at the conductor. And then you have the uh, clapping audience, yeah, actually taking part in doing the music. You know, Viennese audiences usually don't interfere the music. Yeah, this is the closest to a an Oriental belly dancing feast that you ever get in Vienna. Yeah, <laughs> unlike, for example, in Israel, where audiences cough all the time. Yeah, you know, Arthur, Arthur Rubinstein, the pianist, used to say that anywhere in the world, people that have the flu, they go to a doctor. In Tel Aviv, they come to my concerts. <laughs> but, so that's that's a sort of a tradition. But Viennese audiences do not do that. But here, they go out of the regular just to be part of that, to, to become part of the orchestra. And that's great, you know, audiences like you, yeah, make the event. Uh, but what about the conductor? What, what can we say the conductor was doing, actually? Yeah? Um, he was happy. <laughs> and I often show this, you know, the senior management, people get annoyed. You come to work, how come you're so happy? Something must be wrong there, yeah? But he's spreading happiness. I'm sorry, can, can you hear me? Uh, did you hear the video? And then please tell me, did you? Did you, you hear me? I, I, I want to. Okay, the man's English is, it was clear. Okay, it wasn't clear here. I was very worried. Okay. And his um, accent is a bit difficult to understand. But if you listen, you will understand what he's saying. Did you watch the orchestra? Did you watch them play? Did you see the conductor? Now, you see, what was he? He was happy, wasn't he? That's because everything was going well. And what uh, we are trying to say is that as a conductor, as a leader, you are leading. There are many things that are happening. The band playing in front of you, which is your students, the school, your, your, your teachers, people working hard in front of you, being successful. But again, at the background, they are the building, the building, they are being staff who are ensuring that everything is going safely. And, you know, so when you come to a situation, a conductor deals with so many situations, but you are happy when everything is working well. But if you watch the conductor's style, he was not really interfering in what any one of them was doing. He had trained them, he knew they were good, and he allowed them to work. He was not a micromanager. So let me lis listen to another person. And I think happiness, the important thing is this happiness does not come from only his own story and his joy of the music. 
The joy is about enabling other people's stories to be heard at the same time. You have the story of the orchestra as a professional body. You have the story of the audience as a community. Yeah? You have the stories of the individual. Stories unseen. People who built this wonderful concert hall. Yeah? People who made those, you know, study values, Amati, all those beautiful instruments. And all those stories are being heard at the same time. This is the true experience of a live concert. That's a reason to go out of home. Yeah? But not all conductors do just that. Let's see somebody else, a great conductor, Ricardo Muti, please. He's so commanding, yeah? um, so clear, maybe a little bit over clear. Can we have a little demonstration? Would you be my orchestra for a second? Can you sing, please, the first note of Don Giovanni? You have to sing, oh, and I'll stop you. Okay, ready? <laughs> well, come on, with me. If you do it without me, I feel even more redundant than I already feel. So, please, wait for the conductor. Now, look at me, uh, and I stop you. Let's go. Ah. So, we, we'll have a little chat later. But, there's a vacancy for a... Uh, but, um, you could see that you could stop a, an orchestra with a finger. Now, what does Ricardo Muti do? He does something like this. Oh, 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 oh. And then, sort of... So, not only the instruction is clear, but also the sanction. What will happen if you don't do what I... But I tell you, so does it work? Yes, it works um, to a certain point. When Muti is asked, "Why do you conduct like this?" he says, "I'm responsible, responsible in front of him." Now he doesn't really mean him; he means Mozart, which is like the third seat from the center. So. So he said, if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm responsible for Mozart, this is going to be the only story to be told. It's Mozart as I, Ricardo Muti, understand it. And you know what happened to Muti? Three years ago, he got a letter signed by all 700 employees of La Scala, musical employees, I mean, the musicians, saying, you're a great conductor. We don't want to work with you. Please resign. <laughs> Why? Because you don't let us develop. You don't, you're using us as instruments, not as partners. And our joy of music, etc. Et so he had to resign. Isn't that nice? <laughs> no, he's a nice guy. He's really nice. But, uh, and for, well, can you, can you, can you uh, uh, do it with less control or with a different kind of control? Let's look at the, uh, the uh, next conductor. Oops. 
Okay. That was an example of a direct leader. I am responsible. I am in charge. You do what I tell you to do. You don't interpret everything according to your own uh, interpretation. You don't interpret. You follow me. You do what I tell you to do. Now, can you see? Do you think it works? You will see. I will ask you for that because do you think it works when you behave like this? Please keep putting things in the chat room and stopping it periodically when you see a chat that's interesting. You know? But do you think it works? What happens is that you are telling, as a leader, you are the only person who tells all the stories. And you could see the first orchestra, the first conductor, there were many stories told. That is, you are really to share. <laughs> you are, he was willing to share leadership, to diffuse leadership. But the second man said, I am the leader. I am the only person leading. You just follow me. Now remember that all those people, talented artists, had to write to me to please resign. If when you are a direct leader in a school, what you are doing is you are disempowering the people around you. When you are a direct teacher in the classroom, what is it you are doing? You are disempowering your students. So that eventually a sense of dependence arises and they only do what you tell them to do. When you are not there to give them directions, they are not able to do anything. Let me tell you as a leader, and because I have moved from job to job, you know you are successful. When you are not there and they keep doing that and even doing better than you would have done, that is success. I went back to one of the schools I led uh, th this year. I stayed there for two days. And when I was finished, I was so moved. I, I said, I even I could not have done what you people would have done. The place looked better. The, 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 the teaching had changed. The curriculum had changed. The whole place was so wonderful to look at. And when I spoke to the head, I said, now I accept that I've been a successful leader. Because I led, I, you people followed me. And you are now great leaders yourselves. So leading to leading, you must lead in such a way that your people are able to tell their own stories. They are allowed to tell their own stories at the same time. That is the mark of a great leader. And even as a parent in the home, and I, I take this from every angle, you allow your children also to be great, to be able to have their own opinion, to tell their own stories. You will be amazed at what will happen. Now, let me go on and uh, possibly play maybe the, uh, one of the last videos I will play now. Uh, people are hearing me and listening. Okay? Thank you. Richard Strauss. young man of about, about 30, he wrote what he called the Ten Commandments for Conductors. First one was, if you sweat by the end of the concert, it means that you must have done what you like better. It says, never look at the trombones. It only encourages So... The whole idea is really to let it happen by itself. Do not, do not interfere. But how does it happen? Did you see? Uh, 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 did you see him turning pages in the score? Now, either he's senile and doesn't remember his own music because he wrote the music, or 
he is actually transferring a very strong message to them, saying, come on, guys, you have to play by the book. So it's not about my story, it's not about your story, it's only the execution of the rhythm music, no interpretation. Interpretation is the, really, the real story of the performer. So no, he doesn't want that. That's a different kind of control. Let's see another super uh, uh, conductor, uh, a German super conductor, Herbert von Kai. Okay, now that was another control, another direct leader. It doesn't look like this because it looks like they are doing what they want to do, but it was a direct leader because he did not also allow them to interpret. He said, Do what I put down in the book to the letter. And it came out beautifully. Now, I want you to notice that all these um, the conductors were good, they were the greatest conductors around. Each one had a different style, each one came out with a different result, but some were better than others. And we are, we are getting to the realm of the greatest one. You can see that in playing that, you see that we have moved from that man who was very happy, he was in control, but he was happy, he allowed them to do what they wanted to do, to the direct man who said, follow me, this is me, I'm the only person allowed to tell any story here. To the other man who behaves as if all of us are telling the story. I'm not controlling you, but he's actually controlling from behind. Again, you can see, now what you have to know about leadership is, there is no particular style that is, that is, um, that, is that, that you cannot use. You can use an amount, of, sometimes you have to be direct to people, especially people who refuse to listen to instruction. But it's a poor management style or leadership style in the long run. Sometimes the second one where you direct from the back can be the best, especially when you are working with professional teachers who know what they are doing. In other words, you allow them to talk. You allow them to, 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 to do what they are doing, but they must follow your rules exactly. That is also another leadership style, and it's also appropriate at certain moments. So leadership, again, I just wanted to show you that leading to lead is not having a single strategy. It's also reading the situation intelligently and deciding the best approach to take. This last one was direct control leadership, but the people didn't feel it so much so. But again, in that kind of leadership, you may not bring out the best creativity because you are still saying, it's my story. Now, let me listen to another person. I hope you are okay listening to my to these stories. Even I hope people are comfortable. Uh, the man that good. No, I'm... okay. I will soon finish. Then we we'll take the comments. Then we we'll just go through the comments. All right. So let me play. Let me play another type of leader. What's different? Did you see the eyes? Closed. Did you see the hands? Did you see this, this kind of movement? Let me conduct you twice. Once like a Muti, and you'll clap. Just once, and then like Karayan. Let's see what happens, okay? Like Muti. Be ready? Because Muti. Okay? Ready? Let's do it. <coughs> hmm. And then. Good. Now, like a Kayan, 
since you're already trained, let me concentrate, close my eyes. Come, come. Why not together? Because he didn't know when to play. Now, I can tell you, even the Berlin Philharmonic don't know when to play. Yeah? But I'll tell you how they do it. No cynicism. This is a German orchestra, yes? They look at Karayan, and then they look at each other. Like... <laughs> do you understand what this guy wants? And after doing that, they really look at each other, and the first players of the orchestra lead the whole ensemble in playing together. And when Karan is asked about it, he actually says, yes, the worst damage I can do to my orchestra is to give them a clear uh, uh, instruction, because that would uh, uh, prevent the ensemble, the listening to each other that's needed for an orchestra. Now, that's great. What about the eyes? Why, is the, uh, why are the eyes closed? Yeah? Um, there's a wonderful story about Kayan conducting in London, and he cues in a flute player like this. The guy has no idea what to do. So, <laughs> Maestro, with all due respect, when should I start? What do you think Kayan's reply was? When should I start? Oh yeah. He says, you start when you can't stand it anymore. <laughs> Meaning that you know you have no authority to change anything. It's my music. The, mu the real music is only in Karyan's head, and you have to guess my mind. So you are in, uh, under tremendous pressure because I don't give you an instruction, and yet you have to guess my mind. So it's a different kind of a very spiritual, but yet very firm control. Can we do it in another way? Of course we can. Let's go back to the first conductor we've seen. Carlos Kleiber, his name. Next video, please. <laughs> So welcome back again. You can see that uh, the last one now, that, 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 that was an interesting one as well. Uh, he closed his eyes throughout and his movements were just fluid. Uh, he did not direct. He's, he's what you would maybe call a laissez-faire leader, which is another form of control, actually. He allows the people to do what they want to do. He does not exercise his authority over them. Uh, he trusts to their ability to do what is right. But, and it works, when you have very high quality stuff, but it's not uh, something that is easy to implement. Because the people must be very good, very motivated, willing to work whether you are there or not. Uh, and uh, and sometimes it, it doesn't work well because you can see that he wasn't communicating. So they didn't know whether they were playing well or they were not playing well. By closing his eyes, he had no connection with them. And so that's another kind of leadership style again, where you can kind of say, well, they know what to do, let me leave them. But when you do that, you, 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 you can, it can lead to a state of anarchy and chaos. Because actually, a leader must show people the way, as we always say, leads the way himself. And uh, therefore, it is very, very important that as a leader, you let people know what your instructions are, you are clear. There's clarity of purpose. I, I could have gone on and on, but I think I'm going to end it because he was going to bring back the first player. I remember that first player, happy in what he was doing, skilled at what he was doing, in control, they knew they were following his directives, though he allowed them some latitude, he allowed them to play the way they could, but he was showing the way. But he was not necessarily forcing them into any particular direction. I remember his joy and happiness at what he was doing. He was looking at them, so they, he, he was communicating with his eyes, communicating with his button, communicating with his body. That is possibly what most of us can actually do in this in, in the climb that we are in. That is, a leader should set directives, be clear about purpose. One of the greatest things a leader can have is clarity of purpose. What do you do as a leader? You set a vision, 
and you build, you 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 populate the vision, and then you lead people into that vision. It's very important that a leader has a vision. So whether you are a leader in your classroom for your students, whether you are a leader as in the principal of the school, the owner of the school, whether you are in your home as the parent in the home, you must have a vision. And you must communicate that vision with clarity and purpose. So I will go back again to my to that my slide. I'm not going to take any more. Uh, the video is not finished and it's called, it's a TED talk by somebody called Ite Talga. And it's, it's, it's a very celebrated TED talk that people play a lot to show leadership. That how do people lead? You know, what are the great leaders? How do they lead with uh, clarity and purpose? And you see it there from those great conductors who are conducting people who are very skilled, but still using different methods to come up with, uh, with a cohesive team. So let, let me go back to the third slide where I talked about the people who are successful during this uh, pandemic. Again, you will see you have to be creative. I say it again, I'm repeating this again, because you have to think differently. You have to be creative. Things are different. We can't say the way our fathers and forefathers did it, the way we are going to do it. You have to be creative. This pandemic has shown us that we have to think differently. And um, the globalization of the world, the technical changes have also shown us that people, are, and I keep emphasizing it, many people are going to lose their jobs. If they, if they do not become creative, take their lives and careers in their hands and stop being dinosaurs. So having said that, you have to be creative. You must think differently. You must think differently. You cannot look, look, look the, the way we do things now, I'm so worried about the students that we are graduating. They may know academic work, but they don't know they don't have the skills to succeed in the world they are going to. And that is why you have to think differently and in your own school, in your own circumstances, start to build in creativity, innovation, problem solving, leader, personal leadership by your students, digital literacy, true digital literacy, not Yahoo Yahoo, but understanding how to use digital literacy to learn, to grow, to communicate, to even entertain themselves, to, to, to research to do their work, that is improve their productivity all in all. So we must think differently. We must continue to look for opportunities. When they say oh, the computer has, I know people, and I know some people who are now teaching across the world. They are not just teaching their own school, they are not teaching across the world. I know teachers who, who every morning stand up and teach across the world because they think differently, they know they are great. And then you have to look for uh, people who, like I said, create scenarios. That look, if this happens, this is how I will react. If this happens, this is how I will react. This is the most likely situation. Most likely, when we return to school, we are not going to return to you standing in front of the class, teaching 20 or 30 children or whatever it is, the way we used to. We'll have to blend because we can't allow too much uh, interaction. So while this thing was terrible, this COVID pandemic, it's also for me, a phoenix. I believe that out of the ashes, a phoenix is going to rise and a phoenix is a beautiful bird. So a beautiful thing is going to rise. We have to be creative. We have to be nimble, swift, flexible, quick on our feet, willing to adapt to the opportunities that are in front of us. You know, we must be willing to diffuse leadership, you know. We must be willing to share leadership. Because you see what we are talking about is too big for one person. As I am, as a commissioner for education, I can't say I'm going to be in charge of everything that is happening. I have to learn that. I have to work with a team. And in working with that team, communicate with clarity. I have to be empathetic. People have all sorts of situations. I have to try and understand them. And I must be intentional. Thank you very much. While I take a few and So, what did you learn from this? So, that's the Q&A. So, let me take the Q&A. So, Abeliza, can I take the Q&A now?
ele não I would like to comment on that person when you are very can I comment on that? That you be being manipulative. Yes, a leader can become very manipulative when you are very direct, when you are in control, because you want to so be in control, you start to engage in a number of inappropriate practices. I know leaders who have spies, spies in the uh, staff room, spies among the staff, coming to tell them stories. This person said this about you. That person said this about you. I know leaders who get into all sorts of inappropriate things of everything that is happening. And at the end of the day, you know, somebody advised me when I was principal, make sure you have spies. I sat and thought and thought about it and said, Look, I'm not going to start finding somebody who will also be able to blackmail me by making the person my spy. And if I, I can hear things in many ways. I don't need to de debase myself to that extent. And I tell you that I did not, and it worked for me. By having spies, you will hear bad things said about you. People will always say bad things about you. Yeah? It's best if you are able to engage people in... Uh, you know, there was one time I had a 360 degree done. My PA and people around me, they did it anonymously and I had them send it to a, to a consultant. How do I behave to you? What do you wish I could do better? How do you think I should change? And each one of them said what they have to say. And I assure you it affects me till today. My secretary said I'm too impersonal. I just want to work and say good morning and do the work. So I said, okay, she wants me to say good morning. How are you today? How is the family? What are, you know, so it's, it's just a minute. So I started saying it, and I got used to it. So that the people around me, I care for them. I show that I care. She puts it there, and I never quarreled with her about that. Because I could see it was a, a, a source for her that she wanted me to be less impersonal. And I assure you that that comment made more than 12, 13 years ago, I still hold on to it. And I, I watch myself because I do have a tendency to be impersonal. That is, we are at work now, we are not here to be playing. But I also know that work is, and we must have relationships. And therefore I try and calm down, calm down in the right way and uh, build relationships. Yeah. I never tell people to do things I do not do or cannot do myself. I would not tell my staff to close late and then leave every, every day very early. I would not, I would get to work on time and I would close on time. And when I'm at work, they see that I am working. I will be courteous to people around me so that by the time I'm giving instruction, the person knows that she can't do it, she does it. But one other thing is, so I'm telling you that authenticity is probably the greatest thing that you can use as a leader. To be authentic, when they say do as I do and not as I say, there is nothing truer than that. So when you give people instructions and they mistrust you, it's because you have behaved your way into a situation where they need to mistrust you. 
I'm sorry to say that. So I think one of the things you have to do is to build up trust and relationships with your staff. To let them know that what I say is what I want to do. What I want to do is what I say. You know, you know, you know yeah. So I think I think for me, I, it's building up relationships. What that question that was asked is a question of relationships. The relationship is not good. You have to build it up. So how do you help follow who do things haphazardly and see your insistence on policy as asking for too much? Well, as a leader, how do you manage people who will never meet deadlines and are not remorseful about it? They simply tell you that is their way. It's because there are no consequences. I'm also, I don't believe a leader should be so soft that there are no consequences. One thing is clear. Hmm? Uh, between what happens to you, and I'm a Stephen Covey certified trainer, where the, it says the, between the stimulus and the response, there's space and time for you to think about what action you are supposed to take. And once you take the action, you are responsible for the consequences of your action. So I assure you, I'm not a soft, uh, touchy feely leader that will now say, George, no, you don't do it, you face the consequences. I believe so much in consequences that when you were doing it, you knew these were the consequences of what you were doing. So when people don't face the consequences, they will continue behaving haphazardly because nobody is uh, asking them to face the consequences of their action. You keep on petting them and begging them or being annoyed, and they know that you get annoyed and move on to another topic. But when you face the sometimes I'm giving people very serious queries. Another question here. I learned to, you must strategize and share your leadership rules. Yes. Uh, that's, that's it. You must have a strategy. Don't let people, don't sit there. Some people wonder, what are we doing in this place? What does she think? What does she want? You must let them know what you want and help them through the process of getting to where you want. And mind you, listen to the advice as well because you don't know everything. Hmm? Everyone cannot be in your corner. 360 is always great. Thank you. And ah, look at Posh. Ah, my Posh lady. That's a lady who I love looking at. Always beautiful. So, Roka Posh, thank you for your comment. Nobody, don't, this job is not about popularity. Not everybody is going to like you. The first thing as a leader that you go for is respect. The first thing you go for is like, like relationships, like liking each other may come. But the best thing people can offer you is to respect you. You don't be started to this, it should always evolve. Yes, just feel the cotton. It should evolve, but don't forget, not just evolve, but also adapt. You have to adapt and read the situation you are in and adapt your leadership role to fit that situation. There are times when you need to be tough and hard. There are times when you need to be soft. There are times when you need to build up a team very quickly, and therefore you have to be a bit direct. So learn how to read the situation. It's part of intelligence, emotional intelligence. How do you cope in a way where you are not allowed to exhibit your leadership? You exhibit your leadership skills where they allow you to exhibit it. As a teacher, if you are in the classroom, you can't tell me you can't be a leader with your students. Exhibit, don't forget, you know, I started my working life as a banker. As a banker, I had one staff, one clerk. After a while, I had to, after a while, I had to exercise. You see, uh, like I said, I'm a Stephen Covey teacher. There's something called circle of influence and circle of concern. Stay within your circle of influence. If you stay within your circle of influence, you will get to that level of concern. Stay within the circle within which you can influence things around you. And you will see that you will become bigger and bigger and bigger. As people see that this woman is good. You don't need to complain. Stay where you are and exhibit great leadership where you are. Yes, I agree. I mean, uh, uh, it's a personal relationship key. It's very important. And uh, Roka Posh again, insecurities cause a lot of the bad behavior. You have to be secure. Let me tell you, don't be afraid that, um, you know, what worries many leaders is maybe they will sack me when they see my staff are good. Uh, when, let me tell you, when you are good, you move on. Let them be chasing you. You keep moving. When you are not allowed to implement new method of teaching. Like I said, stay within your circle of influence. Do it slowly, do it gently. Talk to people, carry people along, explain what you are doing. Let me tell you, it may take time. It's not something that will happen in a day or two. You have to be patient. You have to be patient. So you have to learn to take it a step 
at a time. Stay within your circle of influence. Influence the people you can influence, and then they will start to see that ah, this person is different. We have heard young people go and teach in school. They say, ah, you know, I had a young student, a teacher. They said, no, in this school, you must put questions on the board. You can't print questions. Have you heard of such a thing before? So when she printed, they gave her a query. But bit by bit, the school is not printed because she just calmed down and talked to people. I learned that Kashi Korei, I learned that as a good leader, I should allow others to lead and do what they want to do while directing for me. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Ma. Awesome time with uh, Mrs. Polashade Adepisayo. Awesome, awesome time with her. A lot of questions you need to ask. If you can be dropping those questions, I am going to make sure I send those questions to her. It was awesome experience talking about from leading to leading. And there are lots of points. They actually um, stated that lot of points. I know that... Um, we could not take all the questions. We could not take all the questions, but there are a lot of points. And then those points are powerful. Powerful points that, that we can learn from. Powerful points that, uh, that uh, we need to go and hang on a particular corner in our offices, at home, and, um, and more. You have to be intentional. You have to be intentional. I can't actually forget those points at all. There are so many points there that you need to, to, to 